Like the first question I ask when people come to know your car night is, how many of you were surprised to get an invitation to come back to this dealership tonight? And I usually get about 80% of the hands. Wow. Because they don't expect it. That's They're the expecting a when they take transaction. delivery of the car, they take delivery of the car, they get a wave goodbye. Bye-bye. Good luck. Yeah. Right? You never hear from that dealership again. All right. Hey, Podcast Nation. It's Jason Harris here with Digital Dealership Solutions. Hey, thanks for joining us on another episode of After Hours with Jay. Uh, tonight, guys, I have my guest, Christine Mitchell, a.k.a. the car lady, never reproduced, and the only original. Correct? I am. I am the one and only, my friend. All right, Christine, uh, for listeners out there that don't know you, please share that three to four minute origin story and I will time you on your marks. Get set. No, I'm just kidding. What's the origin story? The origin story. Thanks, Jason, first of all, for having me on the podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. Happy to be here. First woman guest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, the origin of the story is I started my career out in the service department. Mm -hmm. I was a technician. I started in the lube lane while I was in high school. <laughs> and um, I Which apprenticed... dealership? Uh, what, what was the manufacturer? General Motors. Nice. Yeah. And then when I apprenticed out of the store, I went to college. When I got my license to become a technician, there were 63 guys in the class and only one girl. <laughs> and they tried to get rid of me, but I wouldn't go. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and then I had the pleasure of turning a wrench for about 12 years. And when I found out I was expecting my daughter, who is now 21, maternity <laughs> leaves the day you find out you're expecting when you're a technician. Sure. And a lot of stores don't think about it. And it's an interesting dynamic because normally people work through their maternity and then they leave. Well, when you're a technician, yeah. you can't be around the chemicals and you can't lift the tires. So That's very true. Yeah. So I had to leave the shop immediately. And, and at the time, GM was hosting programs called Smart Pair. Mm -hmm. And their mandate was sort of like a second delivery type program. And I was started to teach them. So okay. basically, I had $300 and the worst looking flyers you've ever seen in your entire <laughs> life. I had a used briefcase. And I went from store to store to store to see if these GM stores would let me teach their smart care for them. Nice. And from there, I built it into the car lady. So the car lady name, actually, I didn't choose it. It was chosen for me. When I went into stores, people would say, hey, there's that car lady. That's just something that they recognized you in. Yeah. That's awesome. And the pink came from the fact that it looked good on me. <laughs> and uh, so when they drew my logo, they said, you know, what is the car lady? And I said, well, I am. I'm the car lady. There you go. So that's how it all came together for me all those years ago. And this year will be 22 years we've been in business. That's awesome. 22 years. 22 yeah, we're working years. with just over, uh, just almost 100 stores now. That's very, very cool. Yeah. yeah and you're always, I mean, you're always on the go. You I'm guys always are on the go. How many, shows, how many shows do you guys do a month? A month? Probably 20 to 30, depending on the month. Okay. Yeah, so we have three presenters on the road right now, and myself, so that's mm -hmm. a total of four. And we're in the process of hiring two more, so we need two more presenters. So, I interviewed a great, great girl today. That's cool. I got two more interviews tomorrow. Hopefully we'll find another car lady. I know one when I see one. <laughs> you just It's something you just feel. Yeah, I just feel it. I well, just meet her. You don't even have to know anything about cars. I'll teach you yeah. everything you need to know. But it's about a factor. It's it's the X factor, the moxie. Yeah. And that's what I'm looking for. Somebody who uh, wants to do it as a side hustle. Someone who's got to have a little moxie. Someone who's got to have a female little... in a male dominated space. Right. right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, for a lot of people out there that don't know what an after aftercare. Yeah. Or, know your no, car night. Know your car night. Well, yeah. People don't know what a know your car night is. Can you explain to them real quick what a know your car your nine days yeah so we host know your car night dealerships at dealerships across canada mm -hmm. and know your car night is an opportunity to invite the guest back to the dealership after the sale mm -hmm. so after the vehicle is delivered the customer is registered for know your car night at stores that i'm working with and those customers come back to the dealership traditionally within 30 60 or 90 days and we reintroduce them to the service and parts department because during the delivery quite often there's so much to go over, mm -hmm. even with the technology, that the customer is overwhelmed. So what happens is they miss certain things and the service department has to offer. So sure. know your car night bridges that gap. Our company philosophy has been and will be for the next 22 years. Every year a dealership spends thousands attracting new business. What are you spending to keep it? Well, I think that's a great topic. And one of the topics that we're gonna to talk tonight, if you want, we yeah, can go in that place sure. now. Sure. I, I'm right there with you. The amount of money that we spend to acquire a customer in the front of the dealership, but to retain that customer over the five to seven years that they'll be servicing the vehicle is damn near almost none and very little yeah. time and strategies ever put into that. Well, I see what you're posting, what you're about with your bell to bell and different things that you're doing right yep. now. 
And I see that you've got a strategy and execution and a plan. And so those are great systems to have. And I see through LinkedIn, the different systems that are people are putting into place. And I think that's fantastic, but very little is ever talked about the customers taking delivery. Now what? Mm -hmm. So what happens after the customer takes delivery? How do we get that customer retained back to the store and out of the triangle store? My job is to re-educate your guests about the car that they purchased as well as introduce them to the different departments of the dealership. Do you have a shuttle? Do you have night drop off? Do you have winter tires? Do you have storage? So that they get a better feel for the store long term. But I think very little, and I see it on LinkedIn all the time, everything's about selling more cars, selling more cars, selling more cars. That's all fine and good. That's great. Yeah, social media is the same way. I mean, right. we could look at LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Right. If you look at any automotive dealerships, uh, social efforts, which by the way, I don't believe very few of their efforts are actually social. Um, but but you do see what they are posting out there. It entirely has to do with, Selling acqui more cars. with acquisition and just right. acquiring them. Um, where, you know, for you know, being an ex-dealer principal myself and operations, right. you know that's not necessarily where all of your profit's going to come. I mean, the, the service department that produces over 50% of your net profit gets less than 5% of your actual marketing efforts, right. right? They're the ones that are going to maintain that relationship over the next five to seven years. The gross profit margin alone that you're going to make in that five to seven years will in most cases, and in fact, a lot of cases, well super exceed what you just made on that singular transaction, but then it just sets it up for continued referrals and even new additional transactions. Because um, if people aren't happy in the service department, Jason, I mean, it's all fine and good to sell them the car. Yeah, yeah. But their relationship is really going to be spent in service. So yes. what kind of an impression do you want to leave with that customer after they've taken delivery of the vehicle? Because they're not if they're not happy in service, they're not coming back to your showroom. That's the friends and family um, right. People story, want to do business right? with friends. It's, Absolutely. It's that continued, it's not the fact that you guys hit it out of the park the one time. Okay? Right. This is not a singular transaction Correct. game, right? We have a good solid nine innings here, yeah. you know, and you know it's not just the one inning. You're not, you're not, and the game's not over. The game's there, just right? begun. And, lit, and that's the key. The game has just begun. Just begun. Because if they're not happy in service again, they're not going to buy their next car, and they're going to spend the next four years in your service department, God willing, mm -hmm. maybe longer, right? And I want to make sure that customers realize that what goes on after the sale is really the meat and potatoes of the thing. Because when you make your way into the service department, where do you park? Who do you see? You know, how long is, do you have courtesy transportation? These ongoing kinds of things. Experience. Ongoing experience. That ongoing experience. And that's what we, what we focus on wholly. We focus on after the sale experience, know your car night. See, I mean, I look at these, uh, I think of like referral programs. I, I'm not, honestly, and I know a lot of people who like give me crap for this, I'm not a fan of referral programs. You mean like the of $150, bird dogs, these kinds 100, of things? I'm not a fan of that. I mean, I think simply if they took that money yeah. and invested into just a better uh, user experience through their service and parts department, yeah. right, they will actually maintain the client for a much, much, much longer period of time. Yeah. Right? They, they just got to stop thinking, always acquire, 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 all right? What is that? Love the ones you're with, okay? You just spent all this money creating this relationship. Are you just going to sit around now and just leave it up to chance that they're going to continue to service with you? And if they're going to refer customers, I hate it. I can't believe salespeople out there are calling up customers, all right, and asking for referrals. Right. Fair enough. But if their experience was shite, inside the service department, yeah. do you think they're going to be And they haven't met referral? me. I mean, yeah. <laughs> right? And I haven't had that second chance at a first impression. Because, if again, if something goes on in that delivery, what happens then is that if they come to know your car night, I get an opportunity to kind of help fix those relationships a little bit. Because yeah, I've never sold these people anything. I've never disappointed them in any way. So I can make the dealership look really great. Mm -hmm. This is all we do with a little entertainment, right? It's got to be fun. It can't be Charlie Brown's teacher. It's got to be fun, but it's got to be I educational. I think I consider you entertaining for yeah, sure. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think so. Well, we try to keep it moving. Yep. Oh, at the same time, I mean, there's not very many jobs that you can have where people clap when you leave and people clap when I'm done. So that's exciting news. And we also give people like feedback about, we give the dealership feedback with surveys. Yes. Like at the end of every seminar we give, at the end of every Know Your Car Night, we give everybody in the audience a comment card. Mm -hmm. So the dealership can find out immediately how they felt about the event, anything we thought they could improve about the event. And it's just a win-win all the way around. But if you don't, and it's not expensive. I think a lot no. of people think, you know, oh, well, you're going to hire this girl and she's going to come in. And, you know, for under $1,000, we can get this whole thing done for you. 
But it's not, like I said, I mean, that's just a handful of bird dogs here and there. It's just, right. I think the money's being misdirected in the wrong place, right? right? Um, and what, just one more thing about yeah. that, about the referral process. A lot of stores are using the Know Your Car Night now to reach out to guests who may have been in but didn't close the sale. Sure. So Know Your oh, Car that's a good Night, opportunity right? For the unsold traffic. For the unsold traffic. Right. It doesn't have to just be used for those you've already de- delivered. Sure. It can be though, used for those who you're still hoping to close. Because at the end of the day, we're selling nothing but ourselves. Yeah, but the, the value is not just the relationship from the value, more so is the relationship in the back. Correct. Which I think is even a bigger reason to buy yeah. All right, from a dealership. So a couple things I want to go with that. Uh, we've both of us had an opportunity to be in hundreds and hundreds of dealerships, um, right. in and out of them um, on a consulting level or working level and so on over, over, the, over our career. Uh, any of them really kind of stick out to you that just like just crushed it when it came to a service experience and what did that experience look like i'm even trying to think of some of the deliveries that i've had yeah like when i bought domestic versus import versus luxury yeah um i gotta admit i felt like people in the domestic market tried harder okay right my luxury experience was okay yeah um there's certain stories that really work hard at at what it is that I do, like mm-hmm. they're really engaged and involved. I wouldn't want to name them specifically. Sure. <laughs> I don't want to name but, my but, favorites. But anything, anything in particular, like we were talking before off camera, we were talking about how we found some dealerships, not a lot, but just a few though, right. actually have sales desks dedicated yep. to being in the service department. Well, um, the jewel on my crown, obviously, Don Billy North Toyota. Yeah. It's a great store. I bought my last car from them. Very happy with it. Yeah. But they actually are engaged where they have somebody in the service department that mm-hmm. has a desk. That, that sees guests and sees customers when they come in for service. So if you cool. can flag a Toyota or a Corolla and you can say, hey, listen, this is your repair bill, but this is what we can put you in for the same money per month. Or, you know, I don't know how exactly. There's another option. There's another option. At mm-hmm. least they're exploring those opportunities. Certain stores are taking advantage of that now. And I applaud their efforts because the service customer, if you can catch them in a certain, you can sometimes put them into a new model for the same money per month. Well, why wouldn't anybody do that? Yeah. Right? So it's a lot of opportunity there. What are the in dealership experiences have you seen or maybe processes that just kind of stuck out at you? Um, geez, I don't, that's a tough question. I was just trying to think. Well, I don't see the customers well, you know, until a, they bought the car, right? I was at a Lexus right? dealership, right? right, that had a automated pancake machine. Ooh. It was oh, quite well, impressive. if you're talking about that, I've got and some I, stores that I visit. They got the cafe. That was an interesting. Well, the cafe. They got the, the cafe. They got the, cool. the video games for the kids. They got yeah. the PlayStations for the kids. They got the um, VIP lounge with movies. Ah, there we massage go. Massage chair. Uh, I have one store that gives, has massages in the afternoons, and, I, and the same store also has a girl come in and do basic manicures. When oh, you're wait, in the, in the service? In the service. Oh, see, there we go. Yeah. See, see, these are the things I'm kind of looking for, right? These yeah. little tiny, it's, it's about creating the experience, right? right? At the end of the day, uh, same thing when I come to purchase my vehicle. I can purchase my vehicle from a dozen different locations. I mean, right. if, if I'm going to buy a Mercedes, if I'm going to buy a Nissan. Somebody uh, tries to sell us tons. a car every day. <laughs> yes, very regularly. Um, and I can service my vehicle at just as many different locations, right. probably even more locations, right? That's a popular question we get at the event. Yeah. Is, okay, I bought this car from here. Now, do I have to service it here? Mm-hmm. And the answer is technically no. You can take yes. your car anywhere you want. I mean, you could change your oil in your own driveway if you want to. But yeah. here's A, B, and C, and D. Let me explain to you why you should come here, right? The synthetic oils, the parts that we use, genuine equipment. Uh, the shuttle, the night drop-off, the evening hours, the Saturday hours, the wash after service. These yep. are some of the benefits and experience features the dealership already has that the customer didn't know. Okay, so that's a kicker. So how often, like just roughly, ballpark it, yep. percentage-wise, would you say that most of the customers didn't even know that these were options or features or benefits All right, when they actually purchased their vehicle in the first place? Gosh, that's got to be close to 60 or 70%. Oh, see, look at this. Sixty so on the sell side, of the people sell side, we're tell totally me, missing We didn't even this. know you had. Like last week, I did a show in London. Yeah. And I had seventy-six people in the room for Know Your Car Night. Okay. And I said to the group, "How many people here knew that this dealership had a price match guarantee?" I got three hands out of seventy-six. Wow. That that store. And this is a price match guarantee on what? On winter tires. On tires. Oh, on yeah. tires. Okay. So cool. comparing apples to apples, skews sure. with skews, that dealership and most of you know a lot of the stores have it, mm-hmm. but this was a Honda store. In London, they have a price match guarantee, right? So if you get a price from 
the place that sells the big packages of toilet paper. Costco. Yeah. Costco. Uh, <laughs> and you bring it into the store. If you're comparing SKUs with SKUs and Michelins with Michelins, they'll do a price match. Sure. Plus, they've also got tire storage for only 10 bucks a month. But wow. in that audience, 76 people, three hands, knew that they had a price match guarantee on tires. And, and that's, that's a win. Crazy. That's, that's a win that's, that's for the crazy. store. That's crazy. Right? I, mean, I think about, you know, the, the average customer only visits two dealerships or maybe just a little more than that before they make a purchase. And you're telling me in a group of how, how big was the group? 76 here? people. Out of a group of 76 people, more than between 60 and 70 percent of them didn't even know that this was a benefit for doing business. Correct. At this dealership so it goes down to and this is a consistent theme i've noticed on somewhere on the podcast or probably be a consistent theme all year long is what story are we actually telling the customer and the story of price needs to disappear it's right. not about the story of price when you look at There's their google of, reviews stuff, nobody yeah. ever talks about the price no hardly ever they talk about the experience they talk about the service yeah about how was i treated the guy was, was nice I... or mean or yeah. whatever yeah. yeah nobody ever says oh my payment's too high and even at Know Your Car Night, <laughs> yes. right? If the, if, if the delivery hasn't gone well, uh, I get an opportunity to try to correct some of those wrongs and put those people in front of the right people that help them with that. But hardly anybody ever tells me about their payment. No, I Everybody agree. tells me how much they love the car. I mean, I, I go to, a, I go to a, a, a dinner party and uh, uh, Bob just bought a brand new car. And Bob doesn't, when I ask Bob, well, what'd you buy? Bob doesn't normally respond with, you know, the, do- the 199 bi-weekly one. We never talk you know, about that. Like, like, oh, wow, Bob, congratulations. You bought the $199 bi- bi-weekly one, man. Congratulations. It's awesome. That's not, that, that, that's, mm-hmm. never, that's never the thing. That's not the story. So, you know, I, and, and I think it's both on the sales and the service side. It's the story that we're telling. Right. All right. So. Um, and seriously underrepresented in parts. Nobody oh, ever wow. thinks of poor Seriously. little parts. I know. Right? He's like the red-headed stepchild of the dealership. I'm poor the ex- little parts. I'm the accessory king out there. You know right. I love accessories. I love an accessory. And, and it's just not part of the sales process. I go to the Chrysler store. Process. We're actually flipping the itinerary. We can customize these events any way you want. Yep. Right? doesn't matter to me. We're actually flipping the itinerary so that we get an opportunity to go to parts first. Yeah. And I know who's coming to the show because my company also can handle for dealerships the invitation process. So mm-hmm. we can send out an email and we can make the phone call. So I know what Joe is driving. So when yep. Joe comes to know your car night, when I walk him back, to the, we're going to have a piece of paper with all Joe's accessories ready for him. Priced out. Yeah. Right? Win. You want running boards? You want a tunnel cover? You want a truck bed liner? You want mats? Here's your, here's your list, Joe. Well, the average right? consumer spends win. over eleven hundred dollars in accessory in the first six months of ownership, right? And the dealership gets less than fifteen percent of that. Correct. Um, stop going to the triangle store. Yeah, stop going <laughs> to the triangle. Store. There's a reason why triangle stores in business. I mean, it's the Listen. dealerships. The dealerships just clearly didn't even care or or care enough to put a process into place. I don't want anybody sending me letters. Let me just say to your <laughs> listeners, don't send me letters. I love Canadian Tire as much as the next person, but you shouldn't. And I love Costco. But you don't buy tires where you buy frozen shrimp. That's my theory. <laughs> no, right? I agree. Yeah. If you're going to buy a rake, get a rake. Okay. <laughs> you don't get, because most t- store. let's be honest, a lot of stores, here's another fact. A lot of stores, once you replace the brake pads, mm-hmm. for, particularly in the Honda lineup, I think it's their mandate. If you replace the pads once, the next set of pads will be covered under warranty by Honda Canada. Now, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Right? You go to, if, you, if you took delivery of a Honda today, do you know that? And where are you getting your brake pads replaced? You know your well, car night, again, bridges these gaps. Bridges these gaps so that your customers know to bring their dollars and their business back to your dealership. That's my so goal. Service, um, our service presentation yeah. during our sales process needs to get incredibly better. Um, yeah. Usually, it's just a matter of walking by and say, oh, yeah, here's the service department. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it used to be, you know, it was a better system. And when you did oil changes every three months or 5,000 K, the way everybody used to, mm-hmm. um, it was an easier get. But you look at some of the vehicles today, you know, in the Toyota lineup, you only service those that do an oil change. You service every six months or 8,000. Twice a year, right? Once a year for oil now. Traditionally, yeah. 12 months, 16,000 K. The Audi, again, Volkswagen, once a year, 15,000 K. You might not see these people. So know your car night, thanks them for their purchase, and again, gets them back into the store, which is your goal. Well, I, I mean, I think really what it kind of comes down to is the bottom line is that you need to have an after sales strategy and Something. process. And it's not just about acquisition as much as it is about retention. Correct. All right, make it, the customer needs to be happy. 
Yeah. Right? And if, if they're not happy, then they're not going to continue to do business with you. They're not going to come back for their next purchase. And they're sure in the hell not referring any of their no. friends and family to the dealership. No. So, I, I mean, I agree with you. I, it's just a sheer lack of just no strategy whatsoever. We right. just need to put something in place. And if your goal there. is to sell more cars, we can help with that too. Because yeah. we can talk about the dealership in a way that puts it in the best possible light for the next four years, yeah. which is your goal. Another thing I want to talk about with you tonight is you're a lady. You're I'm a lady. The car. The car lady. The car lady. Hashtag and, the car lady. <laughs> and, and I think it'd be unfair if we didn't talk about women in automotive. Um, you know, there's been some great conferences that have been coming that have, that have been. Uh, yeah, three years, so three, years, I think, three, three years now. I think three years now. We've had the women in automotive conference, yep. uh, and it's on. It's on to the remarketing, the automotive remarketing conference. Yeah. So it's the last day of that conference where they have women come, um, and there's awards. Last year, I received the award as a leader in the industry. Yep. Um, which was very exciting. My mom was thrilled. Um, <laughs> it was nice to get a plaque and get recognized for my years in the business. It was very exciting. Um, but yeah, so we've had the women in automotive conference, and I'm. Oh, since I've met you, and I met you in the spring of last year, I've actually taken a little bit more time to mentor other women there as an go. opportunity. I'm so glad to hear that. And I'm, you know, there's no charge for that. No, I'm here to help. No, no, no. Like I met, uh, was at a dealership the other day uh, that I do a lot of work with in Hamilton, and they were getting ready, to, they were interviewing, the sales manager was interviewing a young lady. Yep. And she left the store, and I went to the sales manager, and I said, listen, if you need help, mentoring training I know you've got your own systems and I think that's great of course but if you need some help from a woman with an automotive background particularly on the service side if you need some help with that here's just call me we already do business together call me I'm here to help you because I've been doing this game a long time well I love seeing there are more I would say in the last five years I've seen more women get into the industry than right. I have the previous five. I gotta say in my in my experience, I've always been treated extremely well. Yeah. I think there is instances that go on in the industry where women are not treated particularly well. I have to be honest and say I've never been harassed. I've never yeah. been talked down to. I've never had any negative experience as a woman in the car business, perhaps of my personality. <laughs> well, and I think we need to encourage more women to get into the industry. Yeah, how do we do that? That's I a mean, question that's, that's that really comes up every conference. That's what no. we spend the majority of time talking about. How do we get more women in you the know, business? You know, I, I look at it from the marketing side, right? right? And I take a look at our deep analytics, and especially on a demographic level, right? We have more women spending time researching shopping vehicles in specific brands and dealerships than we do males right I mean, it far exceeds that so you know i've had some dealerships you know start to take a look at these demographic information and start developing out an ad strategy that does cater more to a yeah. female audience and now just within the last couple of years i've started to see dealerships start to actually develop out processes and operational processes uh, that are more geared towards a female audience right right you know trying to make you know the car buying experience more of a female friendly place because honestly I don't think it has been is that fair to say is it's it, been it difficult like I hear like, it, horror, female, I've heard the horror know? stories like you have right? yeah yeah it's been um, you know it was never you went into the dealership as a woman and bought your own car you always took your dad or your uncle or your husband with you right it, but now just, women are going in the car they're yeah. making their own decisions they got their own money so we need to be prepared for that and yeah. I think most stores are very good I mean the first panel that I was on for the Women in Automotive Conference, my panel was called Battling the Bias of okay. Women in Automotive. And I said, I disagreed with most of the points because I said, ladies, the script has been flipped. We're now in a power position. Oh, I 100% agree. Stores are begging for women yes. to come and work in the industry. Not just in F&I and administrative positions, but you need more women service advisors. And if you can get a, a woman technician right now is gold. I tell oh, every young lady yeah. that I meet who wants to get into a trade to get into automotive. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're, we're seriously lacking in the technical support. And as a woman in automotive, if you get a ticket, you could basically call your own shots because every store wants more women in the shop. So how do we encourage more women to get into the industry? Well, that's a great question. I think it has to come from women leaders in the industry. And I, I think it has to come from the manufacturer as well. It needs to be more attractive to join mm. the dealership from the manufacturer perspective. So that when you so that they're actively recruiting women and young girls to get into automotive from a from a beginning standpoint. Because I think that, you know, even these college my daughter's gonna be graduating college this year in business marketing. Sure. <laughs> and she there's a lot of these recruiters are calling, there's no dealerships. 
There's nothing in automotive. So no one's out there actually. So nobody's out there recruiting it. women to come and work in automotive. There's a whole audience, point. a whole opportunity there. Not that large I'm aware of anyway. No one's, Perhaps no one's it's happening and I'm just not aware of it. But well, I will say this: I actually had a couple of dealerships uh, just within the last twelve months actually asked me to run a job ad campaign. Right. All right, against a female audience. Yeah. And uh, video content for that female audience to show them the benefits of coming to work at their dealership. Yeah. Now, I would say that I mean out of the. 60 some odd that we work with too right you know but that's that's it's it's becoming bigger i had a meeting last week and i put actually posted the button on linkedin because then the meeting was me the technician yeah a parts manager was a woman and the service manager was a woman and it was the first time in 22 years of my entire career that we had three of us in the room yeah the trifecta all women yeah and i've never experienced that in 22 years i mean sometimes you'll get a lady parts manager or a service manager but you hardly ever get both yeah. So that was, that was an interesting dynamic. Uh, I just like to see, you know, it is pretty inclusive, and I think there's lots of opportunity for women, but it's just getting the word out. And I think that's either got to come from mentorship from women that are currently in the business, or it's got to come from the manufacturer. For we've, sure. We've got I to come so. to something. Let's talk about the world of training. Let's um, talk about the world of training. Let's talk about training. Let's talk about... Okay. Um. <laughs> yeah, everybody's training. Everybody's Every, training. Nobody's I learning. Think, I think everyone's talking and no one's listening. That's really what it kind yeah. of comes down to, right? Yeah, there's everybody's training, nobody's learning. And what is going on out what's there? What's going like, on out there? Everybody and their mother all of a sudden is a trainer. And I think if you are a trainer, like just to get back to what we were saying before, if you are a trainer, then why aren't you finding more women in automotive? There's not many women trainers, but it yeah. seems to me that all the social media, all the LinkedIn that I see right now is again these trainers, 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 trainers. Back to sales and sales and sales, yep. and I think there's there's huge opportunity missed. I know there's some people that work specifically with service departments, but I think there's some opportunity lost there. I'd like to see that increase. Well, I think what you probably see is um, the benefit of what you guys do on the service side uh, really develop out an an experience to increase the retention. Correct. Right? And right now we're not training on the experience. We're all of our training is self-serving. I, I that's that's my fundamental problem. And don't get me wrong. I think there's a handful of trainers out there. I personally know some of them that I think are crushing it and doing a great job. Me too. But the majority of training that's going on out there is literally about self-serving. It is not with the intent to serve others, but right. the intent to serve your own personal needs. Right. Um, and, and that drives me nuts. The happiest moments I have in my career is yeah. when I'm serving others. Right. How can I, like the other day I had a woman, I went, went to the dealership and a woman came up to me. She said, I came to your Know Your Car Night in November. And I said, oh, I said, what brings you to the store today? She said, I'm getting winter tires because you told me to. <laughs> That's perfect. Great. Yeah, right? exactly. And now, I didn't tell her to. I probably gently suggested. But I told her the benefits of winter tires, and now she's bought a set because she's edu been educated. Yes. So I think that's part of that experience, right? It's when you educate people as a as a from the service on. And again, I always speak from the service side because they don't know as much about sales. As it's no, it goes both ways. Right. It, it's it's literally see the thing with service that it's actually in it's the word is in its own department service with you have the intent to serve someone. Right. All right. Um, Sales, unfortunately, doesn't necessarily have that approach. You, the intention is you're selling something, you know, you're trying to get them to purchase something. It's right. within your intent, not their intent, right? Um, and, and But I think it's, it's gotta be flipped around to develop out an experience. Uh, at the core of every experience, you have to have the intent to serve the other person's um, needs and wants. Mm -hmm. And if that's not the case, if we're always being self-serving, then it just comes out and it feels like you're being more sold. But pretty much the bottom line is we gotta just stop selling. You know? Yeah, we gotta stop. We just, we just gotta stop selling. Serving, right? well, that's what it is. I, honestly, yeah. I think that's what it I is. I sell nothing at Know Your Car Night. I sell nothing yeah. but our dealership. That's well, my goal. It, it's the brand. See that? So then, what ends up happening when is I'm that that Kia experience store, I becomes sell nothing a brand. But, but I don't sell Kia or Chrysler or Hyundai or Lexus as a company. You're selling the dealership. The dealership. Yeah, see, that's what's key. So you're selling the, the dealership. dealership. I don't talk about the manufacturer. That customer. Well, they've already bought decision. into it. They yeah. want, they've already spent right. their 30, 40, 50 grand in, right. in purchasing the manufacturer. Right. Now we want them to sell the dealership. To sell the dealership. And that's what goes back to what you're always saying about what's the story yeah. of this dealership. What's the story? So my part is just I'm the B side of your album. <laughs> the B side. I'm the B. I'm your I'm B, the B side. side. Yeah, because no, I think there's a lot of things we can learn from that on the A side. <laughs> you want to go with that analogy? Yeah. Um, well, if the A side is the sale and the B side is the service, right? So now you've had the the A, this the experience has been had, right? Yep. Everybody's talked about it. 
now the B side is this guy. So now you bought the car, you bought Audi, you bought Mercedes, you bought whatever you bought, you bought Subaru. Now you need to learn about Barry Subaru. Now you need mm. to learn about the Subaru of Hamilton. Now you need to learn about, you know, Acura of Pickering or whatever you're doing. No, I, I'm really big into um, helping a dealership develop out their brand. Um, and do you find that a little difficult, almost somewhat like pulling teeth when you start talking to them for them to identify who they are as a individual dealership, not as just another Nissan dealership or another Chrysler dealership? Yeah, I see a lot of people that need to be more proactive about their specific yeah. dealership. I was at a store tonight and there was two or three people just standing around, salespeople mm -hmm. just standing around. Now, I don't know what that takes to stand there all day, and I know it's January. I get that. But what is it you can do today, then, to sell more cars? Like, what sure. are you doing? If you've got an eight-hour shift, if you're waiting for ups, you're going to starve to death. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody in the service department that you could contact tonight while you're waiting on a cold January night for an up? Is there anybody you could contact who has service today that you could potentially sell a car to? Sure. Right? How do we cap? How can you capture that? I mean, what's your goals? Well, that kind of goes down to the training. We're not really developing people out with the with right. with the tools that they need to continually be at their A game. It's not like service. See, service. I think a lot of sales yeah. managers have great intentions, but oh, 100 percent. Right. The idea is only as good as how well we execute it. Right. I agree. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's just an interesting thing again that I don't I don't when I go into the store that's what I see. Right. See, I think what dealerships need to realize is that their experience defines their brand, and the brand defines their experience. It goes both directions. A lot of a lot of dealerships go, oh, uh, well, I mean, they've been told for years, every single conference they go out to, I need to create a brand, I need to create a brand, I need to create a brand. No one ever talks about what the hell you actually have to do to do that, right? Yeah, and it has to be the brand of your store. It can't be the it's brand your of your experience. manufacturer. It's your right? experience. Right? Because there's it's 20... Fun. Hot, it's Toyota stores in, in this area. Yeah. What sets your Toyota store apart, right? And that's when I see a lot of times, like the first question I ask when people come to know your car night is, how many of you were surprised to get an invitation to come back to this dealership tonight? And I usually get about 80% of the hands. Wow. Because they don't expect it. That's They're the expecting when they take delivery of the car, they take delivery of the car, they get a wave goodbye. Bye bye. Good luck. Yeah. Right. You never hear from that dealership again. Little gift basket. Little yeah. gift basket. Right. Here's a mug. Here's bye. a mug. <laughs> bye. Right. And know your car night really does give like it makes people feel important. It makes them feel like you know thank you, thank you for and you don't have to do know your car with me, night with me. Well, you you no, can do I, anything, but I you know we do it well. <laughs> Well, it, it all comes down to, you know, look, it's the same thing on my side. When it comes to the marketing, the dealership can handle and do their own marketing, all right? But the idea is only as good as how well they can execute yeah. it, all right? It takes a lot of manpower. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of experience to develop out, you know, these strategies or these experiences like you provide, um, you know, at that level, right? So it makes sense. It really does make yeah. sense for a dealership to outsource outsource some of those yeah. efforts. Now, if they want to make a commitment to bring it in-house, all, by all means, do so. Like, Listen, there's nothing wrong The service with manager's been there since 7 o'clock in the morning. The last thing he wants to do at 6.30 at night is give an hour and a half presentation about how fabulous the service department is. Sure. And as a woman, it's also an opportunity as well because a lot of stores, the women come to the Know Your Car Night, they're happy to be taught by a woman. Oh, they're well, happy to be taught by. I women. think it's very neutral. Yeah. It's neutral, right? Yeah. I, I think men got no issue uh, being taught by a woman, and no. I don't think uh, never get challenged. Women have absolutely. And no. I've seen everything with these things. Like, there's nothing I haven't seen. Oh, I've seen people I fight. I should come one. And I've had people throw up. Give me a hard time. I had a woman's Please water break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a woman's water break once. We had to call nine one one. Yeah, there's nothing I haven't seen. Kids <laughs> running around touching all the food. I, there's nothing I haven't seen. Stick your finger in your ears. Stick your finger in your ears. Yes. <laughs> Little Johnny's going crazy. But I think it's a great place. When dealerships, uh, especially going into 2019, a lot of people are focused on developing out a brand. And yeah. I, I think a great place to start developing out your brand is in that service department. Identify what that experience is going to be. Um, what are some of those core, what I call cornerstones or core values, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That really makes you kind of stand out. Are you the Are you the service department that saves people time? Are you the right. service department, right? I mean, time for, me, time, time for me as a cornerstone is a big deal. Any company out there yeah. that says, hey, How can we'll you make this time? as easy a transaction for me as possible? There you go, right? Uh, uh, transparency. I don't want to service I, my car. No. Make this easy for me. Just make this easy. Right? And of course, everybody's been over-promised when they took delivery of the car. Everybody's been promised, over-promised when they made the sale of the car. Do you know sure. how many times people say to me, oh, where's my loaner? 
Where's my loner? There's no loner here. <laughs> We've got courtesy transportation, right? Yeah. We've got a shop service. But what happens is they've been, sometimes, sometimes they've been overpromised. So they come to know your car and they, well, we were told we were going to get a car. Well, the manufacturer does provide you with a rental vehicle should your vehicle become disabled well under the warranty period. But it doesn't mean that you come in for an oil change, you're going to get a car. We Here's what we have. We have a waiting area. We have Wi-Fi. We have coffee, tea. We have, mm -hmm. you know, these kinds of things. Well, I think it depends on the dealership. I mean, I do have a dealership that's only got 13 vehicles in line ready for the oil yeah, changes. Yeah, that's not, not very often. Um, you not know, very so, often. So, so I, it depends, I think, on I know. <laughs> um, you got to define out what that experience is. And mm -hmm. you're right. You can't just say one thing and do something entirely different. And it has to stop being a two-season business. Uh, service has soon. got to stop yeah. to being a two service. Well, the business. manufacturers are not really helping this, with that part at all. Right. Well, if you're again, if you're start, you're going to starve to death if you're waiting for ups. In the same vein, you can't yeah. have a two service business anymore. Yeah. Right. It's got to be bigger than that, and you've got, and the only way you're going to get that is by showing the differences between your services and our competitors. And that's the bottom line. But you know what, though? I hate to say it, but the manufacturers, and I don't want to go a different direction here, but it just it gets frustrating. The manufacturers are limiting the dealership's ability to make not only gross profit in the front of the dealership, they are drastically limiting the, ability, the dealership's ability to make gross profit in the back of the dealership. And I'm not saying that we're here with the intention of ripping people off, mm -hmm. all right? But what your manufacturer says to service your vehicle is the bare bones freaking minimum requirement mm -hmm. for you to maintain your maintain your warranty it is not necessarily the best way to service yeah. your vehicle it is the minimum effort mandatory right, right to maintain your yeah vehicle. i get asked that question all the time right do i need to rotate my tires well the as, as a technician the answer is yes and here's why 100%. the answer like, is yes and why? here's why yes. but it, to keep warranty valid do they need to rotate the tires the answer is no there is only manufacturer warranty on tires is against wear from the manufacturer, right? Sure. Or uh, defects. Another popular question is, do I nearly need to service my brakes? So usually at the Know Your Car Note event, we'll actually take guests physically out into the shop area. When we have a car set up on a hoist, we pull a couple of wheels off. So we actually explain what the brake service is yep. and why it's important. And people get a better feeling and understanding of what they're buying when they're coming in. Mm -hmm. Certain manufacturers service their brakes at different intervals. And some cars actually have a light that comes on as a maintenance minder that tells you it's time to come in. But does it require to be under, do you need to require to do that service to keep the warranty valid? The answer is no. But if I can explain to you take in 10 minutes. Vehicle. You want this vehicle to take care of you minutes, for years. Can I explain years. to you why you should have your alignment checked? Why you should have your rotates done? And why you should service your brakes? I can save you money down the road. Everybody's happy. That's a win. No, That's I know. A win. It's just I just hate this whole shackled kind of feeling. The manufacturer, look, the manufacturers are. It's a race to the bottom to have the lowest cost of ownership because they all want to boast. Yeah. You know, nobody wants to be number two. Second largest investment next to your yeah. house, right? But, what are but, you doing? So, so literally, <laughs> it is a is a mad race to the bottom. Yeah. Right. To have the lowest cost of ownership, and they are just bringing down the minimum requirements of mm -hmm. service a vehicle to a level. And I got used car managers that are complaining about this because. There are clients out there that are maintaining their vehicle according to their manufacturer's recommended schedule, but that doesn't mean that's a great way to maintain your no. vehicle. And these cars are coming back in not the best of shape, which is damaging the used car industry, yeah. right? Yeah, long term, for sure, yeah. right? And people, oh, well, I bought this new car, and yeah, you know, it's only a couple of years old, and I got to get the brakes replaced. Well, did you service the brakes, <laughs> right? If you had to service them, you would have kept your rotors in better condition longer because yeah, exactly. your calipers were serviced. And on and on and on we go. So these are the kinds of things I think that need to be explained at an aftercare seminar, like know your car night, or again, during the delivery process. But I, I understand, like, it's, you know, when I took delivery of my first car, they gave mm -hmm. me the keys and the books and I went home. My first car I ever bought at a dealership was a 1987 Chevrolet Sprint. Remember those? A Sprint, I remember the Sprint. The three-cylinder yeah. Sprint. 100%. I drove it out of the showroom floor myself. My mother co-signed for me. My payments were $137 a month. I yes. thought I had really died and gone to heaven. And, but I didn't maintain the vehicle very well because <laughs> I didn't know very much about it. But let's, but then I took delivery of the last car a year ago that I bought. I have a, I have a Highlander now. We spent 45 minutes in the driveway teaching me all of the, and I know everything, but the navigation, the Bluetooth, oh, the, the tech is voice astronomical activation. Car. So we never went to the service department. No. We never went to the service department. Because there's so delivery. much tech that needs to be done. By the time we paired process. all the phones yep. and I had to go. 
I was excited and I was ready to go. Yep. Right? So this is the things, these are some of the things I want to talk about with you today. No, I think it makes sense. Hey, look, I think we can wrap it up here, but I think it's great. Look, we talked about women in automotive. That's yep. awesome. Let's get some you more know, mentorship we, and let's get some more manufacturers involved. Completely agree. Look, the, the, the after sales, it's a strategy. A strategy needs to be put in place, right? Yep. And, and, for, and working with us, again, not that expensive. For under $1,000, we can do the whole thing. It's not, look, they just need to make a commitment to it, make right? Make a commitment. All right? If they can do it themselves, do it themselves. So and not I'll turn it for you. Professionals. <laughs> well, no, it's true. It's right. the same thing with advertising. Right? If you do, look, anybody can open up an AdWords account or a Facebook ad manager account, right? But, yeah. you know, I, look, I got nothing but respect for what a technician can do with a set of tools, and I can't. A tool is only as good as how well someone actually can use it. That's true. Um, and I'm, I can get in there, but I'll make a bloody mess of it. <laughs> um, That's why I talked know. to Niall, your technical guy, and he's telling me this and well, telling me that. I said, video. Like, yeah, I'm not going to go into edit my own videos. So it's crazy. your pads in your driveway. So I don't know anything about URLs and all this other nonsense, right? <laughs> Let me stick to what I know. <laughs> and the bottom line is that um, dealerships moving forward in 2019 need to develop out a experience. And yes. the experience does identify what the brand ultimately is. The, an amazing place to start that yeah. and probably the what most the valuable brand of the dealership it. is. The, oh, that's what we're talking about. The brand yeah. of the dealership, yes. Is, is that you start that in the service department. Start to really yeah. identify why someone should be servicing with you. Because let's say you're a Nissan dealership. Now, here we have a shite load of Nissan dealerships with 30... Two, thirty-three Nissan dealerships yeah. in the GTA. Yeah. Um, you know, but when you're talking about servicing, there are hundreds, hundreds of shops out there that will gladly change your oil. So if mm -hmm. you're really going to start developing out what makes you different, what those branding cornerstones are, it's an amazing place to start. Start at that service yeah. develop that service dealership. Yeah, developing that brand and continuing it after the sale. The relationship only begins when they take delivery. It doesn't end. And we've yeah. got to start thinking of those things long term if we want to continue to grow. And back to what you're saying about customer experience, that's what everybody's interested in. And that experience is built in the service department. So it's those stories we like to share. The stories we like to share. And you know, yes. a lot of people say um, they left Know Your Car Night or they left the, my seminar. And then the next day they went, and they, oh yeah, I was at this thing last night at uh, this dealership. Oh, you were? My dealership doesn't offer that. Right? So it just builds and builds and builds from there. We love sharing those stories. All right, hey, uh, Christine Mitchell, thank you so thank much for you, being Jason on the podcast Harris. tonight. I really appreciate your You're time. You're welcome. How can people connect with you? They can reach me on my website, www.thecarlady.ca. They can reach me through my social media, at The Car Lady Canada. Awesome. Thanks, Christine. I really appreciate it. Thank your time. you, Jason. Thanks.